I've had terrible bosses, I've been bullied. They're just places of great drama. You know, it's a human theatre. Isabel Berwick, journalist, author, and host of the Financial Times Working It podcast. She's here to show you how to navigate your career and thrive at work. Gender pay gap, does it exist? Oh uh, yes, the world is getting ruder. Do you we'll think all... that? Yes, I think it is. And actually, workplaces are getting angrier. Does this boss trust their team? People can smell bullshit a mile away. We often cover up uncomfortable things as humans and leaders are no different. New Year's resolutions, should I be staying, should I be going? How do I get promoted? What advice would you give employees to think about in the new year? Okay, number one is... This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs, and HR directors hire the most in-demand and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Vorostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. Isabel, thank you so much for coming on to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. Um, so the story goes that we have got into top three in the careers charts in the UK and also number 17 in the business charts. And I started scrolling and seeing how many female main hosts were mm -hmm. hosting podcasts. And I named three and that was Claire Barrett. My colleague. Your colleague and Grace Beverly and me and Claire, because I posted this on LinkedIn, said, actually, you're missing one. And here's Isabel. And I reached out to you and I thought that would be great to have you on the show, especially the fact that you are the host of Working It podcast, which is very dear to my heart uh, with regards to workplaces, careers, jobs. And so, yeah, I'm very, very pleased to have you on the show and really excited to talk to you. So my first question is, being the host of Working It podcast, what one thing about workplaces you have learned along the way that surprised you the most? Oh, how messy they are. I think we have this idea that we all go to work as rational people and we're, you know, we do have a professional veneer. We dress up, we go to work or, you know, we don't dress up and we work at home. But actually underneath, they can, they're they just places of great drama. You know, it's a human theatre, as a wise friend once said to me. And I think I didn't really appreciate that before I started doing the podcast. Mm, interesting. So is that something that you've experienced yourself? <laughs> yes, I've been in offices for 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. So I'm a real corporate lifer. And I and the podcast is really aimed at people in in corporate life or organizations. I mean, we do do some episodes for more self-employed, but actually I think the corporate life is a very particular kind of life and it takes up so much of our lives. And when it's going well, it can be amazing and it can be a refuge from what else is happening in our lives. But when it's going badly, that infects every other area of our life. And I think until it happens, you don't really realize that. And it, obviously it has happened to me in the course of a long career. I've had periods where I've had a terrible time at work. I've had terrible bosses. I've been bullied. I was pushed out of a job at one stage. But all throughout that, I kind of, I feel that it does allow you to, you know, things move on. You either move out or you move on, you move up. Things change, things always change. Mm. And you learn something from everything that happens to you in the office. Mm. But I suppose what is different about the office is that often we are not autonomous actors and we seek autonomy as humans, but often workplaces don't give us that. And so that tension between wanting to be an autonomous individual and having to fulfill the requirements of our jobs is the central tension of the workplace. And I find it fascinating. I haven't thought of that before. I mean, I do talk about having some autonomy and control within your workplace, but, and I talk about kind of creative tension where, you know, there's agendas are fighting between each other. So that's a really interesting way of looking at it because on the one hand, the company has its agenda, it's trying to grow a business and you know may have a purpose behind it. And then individual comes with own idiosyncrasies and their own troubles at home or dealing with messy childhoods, messy kids at home. And you know, you bring 
some of that into work. And the old school way was you leave everything behind, like the like the TV show Severance. Yes, Have you watched exactly. It? Yes, I so love this it. This idea of you know you're one way in your personal life. But then when you step into that elevator and you reach your whatever 17th floor, you become completely somebody else and you forget everything that happens in your life. So I'm fascinated with this idea about, you know, bringing your whole self to work and also bringing your emotions to work. So what are your thoughts on that? I think that phrase, bringing your whole self to work, is a very well-intentioned phrase and I can see exactly where it comes from. I think it hasn't really been thought through. I think the way that workplaces were was obviously over at this extreme, you, exactly, you, you don't bring anything to work that is going to be problematic. And now we're in a situation where people are encouraged to talk about you know, themselves outside work and to bring, I think bringing all of your identities to work is absolutely great. But when we think about bringing your whole self to work, you know, particularly at the moment with the war in the Middle East, you, know, there, you are bringing your political and you know your beliefs to work that may be in conflict with your co-workers. And we've already seen it actually with Trump in the States, with Brexit in this country. Workforces have been incredibly divided. You cannot leave the polarized political ecosystem outside the door. You know, it comes in the revolving doors. It's in the office. How do you best manage that? And is bringing your whole self to work incompatible with a polarized workforce. And I think that is the question that a lot of leaders and HR people and diversity people are grappling with at the moment. And it ha- it's bubbling under, but I think it will burst out because it's it's they've got to find a way to allow everyone to feel comfortable and themselves at work, but also not to create discord and, you know, outright argument. I've even heard, you know, actual fighting in workplaces. So where is the line going to go? Mm. I, I don't know, actually. Mm. It's a really extraordinary situation we're in at the moment. With regards to handling polarization internally within companies, who or what have you seen work from either companies or internally within you know where you work? What has a leader done that actually helped to manage that internal conflict? Leaders are very worried about it and what a couple of experts have said to me they've said sometimes you have to set boundaries about what you can talk about and actually one person suggested to me that you keep the topics to work topics so you encourage dissent around the project we're working on or a decision that's been made so you allow people to focus their dissent but you keep it within the workplace And you don't encourage people to have a go at each other about their beliefs outside the workplace. Now, how realistic that is, I don't know. I'm not a leader. I think it's an incredibly difficult path at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there are an increasing number of organisations who quietly are encouraging uh, dissent only within a, a work environment. But that's a very difficult thing to to do you know when people are colleagues when you socialize with colleagues you know what you do outside the office is absolutely your business mm. so there's only a certain amount of control and also i don't really agree i think uh there are some companies in the states that have explicitly banned all political talk on slack channels for example but then you sort of think well one person's politics is another person's identity you know after black lives matter mm. if a company were to say you can't talk about you know, racial equity and Black Lives Matter. Well, for your black employees, that's not politics, that's their lives. So I think you're getting into very tricky territory when you're banning, you know, making an outright ban. Mm. So it's a very delicate situation, I think. I think this is the issue with our Western world with the idea of freedom of speech, but then also being able to handle yourself in the right way when you don't agree with somebody. So politely agreeing to disagree, I think is a skill that needs to be taught, you know, at schools, you know, at home and universities and workplaces. And in my opinion, banning it completely, having that conversation just is going to mean that you're repressing the things that you believe in and it's gonna boil over and it's gonna spill out somehow. But then 
on the polar opposite end about, you know, having complete freedom to say whatever you want without any regard for how your words and your action are going to impact somebody else. I don't think that's right either. So I feel like from my perspective, like organizations need to almost teach people how to have disagreements because you might disagree on a political topic, but then the way that you deal with that conflict is going to be very similar to how you deal with conflict about a work-related situation. So they need to be able to learn to deal with that as well. I think we're quite a long way off that. And I think because mm-hmm. the world is getting ruder, that... Do you think all... that? Yes, I think it is. Mm-hmm. And actually, workplaces are getting angrier. Gallup did some research this year, and it showed that you know workers are angrier than they've ever been, uh, in particularly in the UK, actually, more than in the rest of Europe. And, and why is that? I th- well, there are lots of reasons, and I think part, mo- a lot of it is external. You know, you're, you might be struggling with the cost of living. You might have family, pro- mental health or family problems. So all of those are coming with you to work. And so when something frustrates you at work, it's almost like a last straw. But I think a lot of people are disengaged at work. You know, they don't love their work. This, there are shockingly high figures for disengagement. And... Anger comes from, dis, you know, if you're bored and disengaged, anger is a very easy emotion to bubble up, I think. Mm. I find emotions in the workplace also very interesting about how they play out. And times are harder. Jobs are getting harder. And also the workload is higher. So I think as a result, you know, there's there's more pressure. There's more fear around whether your jobs are safe. And not necessarily being able to make that decision to leave to go somewhere else if you're unhappy. Um, What are your thoughts with regards to when people do decide to leave? What's the main reason for that? So there's various drivers. I mean, the reason that never goes away is bad manager. More, More people leave a bad manager than a bad job. And I think that isn't really understood enough by organizations. They Very few organizations invest enough in training. You know, you can learn to be a better manager. Some people are obviously temperamentally more suited to it, but everyone can be a better manager. So there's that. So bad management, particularly things like micromanagement, which I've had in the past, and I, that's a particular trigger for me. um, And it drives people mad. Uh, Or bullying. Mm -hmm. Um, So bad management is a big one. I mean, straight up more money, better job and particularly for younger you know for the gen z cohort that's now in the workforce they are showing signs of job hopping a lot more even than the millennial younger millennials that came before them so people in gen x boomers and gen x so i'm gen x i'm quite an old gen x you know there's a very sort of linear corporate mindset in a lot of us but I think that's gradually being lost. And I think the reasons for young people swapping jobs, you know, might be flexible, more flexible work, might be better perks. So there is a lot, there's a lot of factors now, but the, the perennial one is terrible managers. Mm. I interviewed a Lou Adler, who is one of the top recruiters. He's written a book called Hire With Your Head and various others. He talks a lot about performance-based hiring techniques. And one of the things he was saying is that out of, I don't know how many placements that he's made at a senior level, the very few that don't work out, majority of the reasons why they don't is because of the hiring manager, um, the line manager that they would report to. So essentially their boss. And when I speak to candidates as a recruiter, they don't necessarily talk badly about their boss, but a lot of it, either it's there's no progression internally or there is some kind of conflict or, you know, you don't agree on things. So yeah, for sure, from my experience, that's definitely the case. It's, um, it's very difficult to navigate your work when your boss, either that you don't agree with them or don't see eye to eye, or they just don't play their part in your success. And one of the questions that Lou Adler has for his candidates is to think through who was the boss that was directly responsible for your success. And then if you are going for another job elsewhere to really think about the qualities they had and to look out for those 
in the next person that you go and you work with. So I thought that was a really useful, handy tip. I think so. And I think people often look at the money when they're moving jobs, but actually looking at the corporate culture that you're going into is huge too. And I think there's things like Glassdoor now, you can look on LinkedIn, you might activate your network to find out if a friend of a friend works there. But I think in the past, people didn't do those things. You would just go on the money and it's a nice office and everyone's lovely to you when you're interviewed. Mm. But but actually thinking about these who am I actually going to be working with and what is the culture like? Mm. A lot more people are starting to ask that and that's I'm delighted. <laughs> what other questions can a candidate ask when going for an initial interview with a potential new boss to discover if they're going to be a good boss for them? That's a really interesting question. How could you, you could frame it around something like, you know, could could you talk to me about your team meetings? Could you talk to me about how you work? You know, does the boss trust, you know, you, you can infer from that how the boss trusts the team. I mean, essentially, you want to find out, does this boss trust their team? Because without trust, there's nothing. Mm. For sure. I think this idea of caring for your employees and, again, going back to what Lou Adler said about being invested in their success. One of the questions that I like in particular is, tell me about the people who used to work for you, where they went and what they're doing now, I think is really revealing because it shows whether they even know or care where the people have gone and also how they discuss that relationship, I think also can be very illuminating in how they would treat you in that place. Um, yes, that very old fashioned way of, um, you know, taking people leaving as a betrayal is still relatively common, I mm -hmm. think. I don't know what you, you find. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, I haven't experienced it myself, but I've seen a colleague once who went to our boss saying that she had an idea to maybe relocate or move somewhere else. And the way that the boss responded was, I can't believe you're leaving. And she wasn't even saying that at the time. That even pushed her to decide that actually this is not a place for me. And I've seen how similar <laughs> bosses treat those who leave. It's almost as if you're betrayed and they have gone somewhere else that, you know, you're you're not loyal anymore or you're not a good person. And I mean, talking about bringing all of yourself to work, right? What's going on there? From a negative there? perspective, in terms of why is somebody else's success your failure? And I think that's where you need to start asking questions, especially when you see your colleagues being treated in that way. Maybe you haven't experienced it yourself like I did. Um, maybe questions need to be asked, well... If this is happening to my colleague, can that also happen to me? Yes, I think bosses who treat staff as their sort of, it's a personal fiefdom and loyalty is everything. They are in insecure. I mean, it's their own insecurity. But all, the whole phenomenon of the boomerang employee, uh, you know, big companies are now maintaining alumni networks, keeping an eye on what's going on with their ex-employees. Mm -hmm. And an increasing number of people are going back to old employers. And in a hot talent market, why wouldn't you cultivate your alumni? It seems extraordinary to me. But again, it goes back to our, our flaws as human beings and not being able to get over ourselves. Who does it best in your experience, like to actually name companies that do have a lot of boomerang employees coming back to them? I, well, I mean, I've talked... I've only talked to big ones, obviously, because they have a lot. So some like the big four, for example, mm -hmm. uh, often have people who train with them, go off and do other things and then come back. So I talked to someone at Deloitte who I think was their head of, you know, alumni network. You know, so they have people who keep an eye on the talent and and then they think about who, you know, when they bring people back or for older employees, Boomerang is is quite interesting. I talked to Josh Burson, who's a big HR uh, specialist in the States and a lot of older sort of 50 to 65 year olds are going back perhaps to old companies perhaps in a role that was lower than the top executive roles they had but they are you know well off 
they're enjoying it and they can go back into more of a kind of mentoring role which is an interesting shift for a lot of older workers that not enough people think about mm. um so i think these sort of demographic shifts where people are staying longer in the workforce are favoring the companies that allow people to leave well and leave that door open mm -hmm. because you've got a huge pool there potentially of people who are well disposed towards you who know and also they come back in and they know the corporate culture they know how the account system works they can pick the tech up again hopefully so so there's a that's a sort of that's an emerging trend i'd say that i think is really interesting yeah the question is do you want to spend money on maintaining those relationships and creating some kind of a, an alumni network or do you want to spend that money on recruiters who will be looking for new candidates for you when you were talking about the younger employees generation z and that they are more of job hoppers do you think they're less tolerant of bad bosses yes or what are they less tolerant of everything bad in workplaces i mean i think a lot of older managers get quite exasperated with their gen z employees but actually maybe we should flip that round and say why did we put up with this stuff for so long maybe we can learn from them and i i think what's interesting about gen z is they i think a lot of older managers worry about the fact that you know they might get cancelled they might say something wrong but i would probably say what can we learn from them um so reverse mentoring is becoming a big thing in in a lot of big companies where younger staff uh mentor older executives mm, i love that so and it started off actually a few years back when i first heard about it it was really the young staff showing old people how to use instagram basically and that has morphed into something much deeper and richer about exchanging experiences and it's often reverse mentoring is often done where the younger partner is someone from a you know a person of color or someone from a minority background and you've generally generally speaking your top executives are white men in a lot of traditional companies so you're they're bringing a very different perspective and ex an experience to that uh, relationship but it can work very well i think mm. talking about male employees let's talk about gender pay gap does it exist oh uh, yes it does exist and it's still it's being reported again now after a hiatus in the pandemic i mean there there are caveats in that it's only bigger larger companies that have to report it but i think what happened at the bbc with carry gracie you know raised a lot of issues around you know pay gap in a very public organization in all respects and i think but i think that's been mirrored in a lot of other places but i think the issue of pay is i i think i probably wouldn't focus on the pay gap i'd focus on transparency measures now full pay transparency is for very few companies i've interviewed a couple that do it and it has pros and cons but i think trying to be as transparent as possible about salary bans perhaps or this you know putting a salary on the job advert to share salaries with colleagues that's something i've done with my colleagues in the past and that and they've gone on to get pay rises you know why is it that we are so secret about our salaries in a corporate employer but when who's that benefiting it's benefiting the bosses i mean they used there are some companies where they used to have gagging clauses you couldn't talk you know you had to yeah. say yeah i'm not going to talk about my salary now i appreciate it's probably different in a sort of uh, bonus and variable compensation based company where you have to make your own salary essentially but if you're a corporate worker with a fixed salary i think the notion of salary sharing is going to become bigger and bigger particularly among younger workers who don't have that sense of shame because essentially if you think if you find out you're paid 10,000 pounds next to the person less than the person who sits next to you you're going to feel that's you're inadequate but for many women that's not the case and i'm sure some men too it's just that that other person has been recruited in or that other person has worked full time where you've worked part time and are now building back up mm -hmm. so i think if we can if we can separate our pay from our sense of self-worth 
we are on the way to helping to erode the gender pay gap. But I think it has to be a bottom up movement, really, at this point. So you're saying that it's down to employees to take control of that and share it amongst themselves. I think that helps. And the other thing, there's a campaign going on at the moment, I think, to stop employers from asking people what their salary is when they go for job interviews. And that I think there are some parts of the States where you're not allowed to ask it. And that, that can be a very limiting question because uh, particularly women will be inclined to be honest. I mean, of course you can bullshit and say my salary is X when it isn't. But but I think just asking the question is pernicious. Mm. I I don't know what I think about that, actually, because as a recruiter, that's part of my job is asking people salaries and understanding where they're at. But that goes both ways in terms of advising the candidates about what level there are at in the market compared to everybody else and also to help them to neg- to negotiate their salary higher um, and likewise for clients because sometimes they have a certain budget and there's some candidates they simply could not afford so kind of sitting in the middle of it that is a useful question but you could say what are your salary expectations mm. which is not the same as saying what are you paid at the moment for a you know i think this would predominantly be an internal yeah you know you're going direct to a company but i wonder if women themselves would not put as high of a salary expectation as a man oh i think you know without wishing to generalize but for sure mm. and that is part of the issue because you can be transparent about the salary or you can be you know putting your salary to you know an outrageous number but yet those differences still exist but you must be able to tell when someone's saying an outrageous number (laughs) i can pretty much estimate what a person's salary is after 15 minutes of speaking with them yeah i don't know what it is i mean i guess it's just speaking to hundreds and thousands of people and from my perspective if someone's not willing to give me their salary it's usually because they're underpaid so that's headhunter's perspective on that what can companies do to close that gender pay gap well, you can get software now that, you know, assesses salaries to, and it'll flag the ones that are not in the right range. So they can do that. They can do it manually if they want to. They can benchmark everybody against each other. But I mean, the, the simplest thing is to promote more women and people from minority backgrounds to more senior positions, you know, change the dynamic of the structure of your company. The more senior women you have, the, you know, the pay gap will close. Mm-hmm. I think in, you know, in a smallish company, it only takes a few people to leave and the pay gap closes. It's quite, you know, it's not, one person can can skew a pay gap in a, in a relatively small company. Mm. What have you seen that works when with regards to companies that do this well, that promote more women? It isn't really about pay ultimately. I mean, obviously the pay is great and, and closing the pay gap is great but it but if you promote more women and more people who are different I suppose from the traditional kind of executive it changes the culture of the company so for example if there if there is one person who's different one woman one person of color in a meeting of 12 white men they are probably going to feel outnumbered and not say something I think I've read reports often that say three, say three out of 12 is a critical number in a meeting. But often companies will say, you know, one and done. They used to say that for women, didn't they? Mm. You know, we're one and done on the board. We've got a woman, so we don't need any more. And so limiting your idea of what diversity looks like at the top is, I think, probably the biggest barrier we're facing in the next few years in the workplace because it will erode the gender pay gap it'll uh, put people into positions of power that younger people can look at and say that person is like me which I think is underestimated you know I'm not saying role models per se but I'm saying you know I can get I can get there well it is role models it's about you know if I can see her I can be her. I can I mean, be referring her. to to women, but having. I don't something... think everyone should be inspiring, though. You shouldn't have to feel the burden of being inspiring. I think that's a lot. 
nobody's perfect, but mm. exact, but exactly that, just the visibility. Well, I think it's having somebody who is in a position of influence or seniority that is in itself inspiring. I mean, in, you know, do they need to be charismatic? No, but it's about the fact that this person has shown that they are skillful, experienced, and you know, and 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 has been promoted into that role. So if they can do it, then I can do yeah. it. If they represent you, charisma is a really difficult word, actually. I mean, you put, I'd be interested to hear your take on this. But people get so bamboozled by charismatic men. I'm going to say, and often men get promoted because they're charismatic. And there's been a lot of research on, you know, they're, they're, how mediocre people can be, even if they're, you know, there's a there's a researcher called Thomas uh, Chamorro Prezunik in the States who wrote a book called, why, you know, Why Do So Many Mediocre Men Get Promoted at Work? And the answer is because they're charismatic and they carry people with them. But so I think charisma I find very dangerous. I mean, if I should do a podcast episode just on charisma because it's dangerous. It can be very exciting and people love a charismatic leader, mm -hmm. but with the best will in the world, most of us are not super charismatic and it can mask a lot of terrible things. It's a very interesting point because, you know, we get, especially if we're not ourselves maybe charismatic or maybe that's a quality we wish we had more of, then it becomes really attractive. I mean, there are studies to show also, you know, if you're good looking, you also people think you're more socially competent and just competent per se. And so there is something to do with how we are wired biologically that we seek out people who are charismatic and we give them more qualities than they actually have. And I think that also goes down to educating ourselves about, you know, our own triggers, our own behavioral thought patterns to separate you know, the shiny, beautiful things away from actual fact and seeing what actually happens. So it's this, I think it's the difference between what people say and what people do. Yeah. I think that's probably similar to what charisma is. So there's a lot of talk rather than, you know, what happens behind the scenes. Yes, yeah, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but do you carry your intentions through? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, no, so that's really like super, super interesting. What other, when you're talking about how people are messy in the workplace, can you give an example of, you know, something that is messy, but maybe is effective? Oh, there is messy, but effective. So I think the kind of manager that is directed and, and doesn't bother with niceties so, uh, you know, people who instill a little bit of fear, they can get results, but actually that can result, that can be messy because people are not really giving it their all. How engaged are you going to be if you're actually fearful rather than enjoying or, you know, bringing something extra to it? You're going to do the bare minimum. So mess and, and other sorts of mess are more kind of avoidant mess which I think is much more common than confrontational mess. For example, uh, this is a particularly British thing, but feedback is very difficult. If uh, So I get a lot of uh, problems. I have a, a, a problem column in my newsletter <coughs> called Office Therapy. And I get a lot of, so I had one recently, someone said, you know, I've been asking for extra tasks at work. None have been forthcoming. Suddenly I get assigned extra menial tasks. Then I'm, I send an email to my manager expressing my disappointment and I find myself in a meeting with HR and I'm on performance review. Now, clearly something has gone on behind the scenes there. And this, you know, a manager is not happy with someone's performance, but they haven't said anything. And they just suddenly call in HR. So this sort of avoidant, of difficult feelings or difficult conversations, I would say that's probably the most prevalent form of mess. And it's it's invisible mess because it's it's things that are not happening. But it, it causes enormous amounts of anguish, heartache, probably people leaving when they don't have to. I mean, the whole issue of feedback is another whole, you know, can of worms. Mm. But not telling people how they're doing, but whether it's good or bad, we don't give enough praise which is an incredibly effective tool. Um, people respond to praise so positively 
And all you've got to do is drop an email or a message to your team saying, well done. And not just uh, about that task. So, and be quite specific. So thank you so much for going the extra mile with that meeting, setting up, clearing away and, you know, clearing up the slides when you didn't have to. I really appreciated that rather than just thank you for your work on the presentation. So I think all the research shows that if you give a personalized bit of praise, it, you could, I think the, the, the rewards are incredible. The graphs are sort of off the scale in terms of that. And then at, you know, at the other end of the scale, there are ways and ways to do criticism. But I think to your earlier point, you have to really think about it and probably be trained to do it because that doesn't come naturally to us. No. I wonder if it's a relic of the industrial age of working, treating workers as cogs in the machine like robots where... You know, you have a director or a supervisor who is the all-knowing, you know, entity that directs everybody. Like, you do this work in this way and you do it in this way. And there's a right and a wrong answer. And now that we're living in information, AI, you know, what's our humanity adding to this workplace? Because, you know, we've got all these tools and machines and uh, automations and technologies to make it happen that... We actually have to unlearn how we work as kind of like cogs in the machine and learn a way of interacting, communicating, collaborating, influencing, like persuasion, like all of that becomes much, much more important, which is why it's interesting that the Gen Zs are kind of catching up on that and saying, you know what? you know, I'm not a machine, I'm a human being, I have my needs, then, you know, putting that spanner in the works of actually, you know, changing that mentality. And yeah, we have to learn how to interact with one another. And I think it's really interesting about feedback, what you're saying, because I recently read a book called Playing Big, uh, Tara Moore. And she has a chapter, and this is actually aimed at women in terms of, you know, in a critic, you know, really learning to listen to yourself, but also the power of feedback, but also its downsides. Um, how And she gives a really brilliant um, sort of explanation of how to listen to feedback, but also how to separate yourself from it. And I thought that was really, really interesting. But um, I kind of rabbited on about talking about that. But I think the feedback piece is really, really interesting because you're right, um, a lot of bosses don't offer that it's this kind of closing yourself off from having to deal with something that's just really uncomfortable this is uncomfortable um it's more uncomfortable to give bad feedback but equally i think it is uncomfortable to give positive feedback because you have to think of it and then sort of expose yourself to some extent to to offer that so i don't know if that's what you're thinking oh yeah i, I mean i think bad feedback's worse than no feedback and I think most feedback is bad. And someone's just written a book about Bridgewater and Ray Dalio, haven't they? And this extraordinary kind of total transparency feedback situation they've got going on there, which to me is like, it's an abusive sort of workplace. And uh, you know, one of my worst ever work experiences was um, for my annual appraisal, my boss took me to Pret or Leon or somewhere and we sat there and they just sort of, launched into this kind of tirade against me and and my inadequacies and I started crying and they but they weren't work you know they had a sort of piece of paper in front of them they weren't working to it and I just thought this is like one of the worst I'm supposed to be professional but this isn't a they're not offering specific instances of what I've done wrong they're just giving me a list of all the things they don't like about me and the fact I'm part-time and have children and mm. you know what the main thing was you leave at five which was in my contract, so I could leave at five. So I, I, maybe I'm biased <laughs> against feedback because of this sort of terrible moment I had in my career, but I do think it takes a lot of training, both on the part of the person giving it, and as you say, on the part of the receiver, mm -hmm. to separate what you're hearing from your sense of self-worth. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, but I mean, that goes to all of our you know, I find I have found it very difficult to accept my own blind spots as I've got older. I can see them more clearly. But, you know, I was in therapy for years 
and it was just a kind of, I still am, but you know, it was a sort of self reinforce It can be, even if you're someone who thinks they're self-aware and is in therapy, it can be a self reinforcing process. And so I think there probably is a role for feedback in getting us to a place where we know we have to change or do better, but how we get there, it, it's a very skilled and delicate process on mm. both sides. I totally agree. And thinking through feedback from myself, my own personal experience. So I interviewed Kate Waterfall Hill, who is the leadership coach and also a bit of a TikTok sensation. And I really wanted to do a session with her on values, which involved, well, first of all, thinking of my own, but also asking for feedback from my friends and with very interesting consequences. I mean, one made me very upset and actually made me cry in a good way well both it was both good and bad because I'll talk about the good but the bad was is that I realized that the feedback was so disconnected from who I saw myself as a person and that made me also focus on the first value that I had, which was connection and made me realize that actually me and this person have been deeply disconnected for a very long time. And as a result of that, that caused me to seek out more of the connection with them. Um, so that led to a good piece of it. But reading very closely the book by Tara Moore playing big about how to separate yourself from criticism and praise which also goes down to feedback, also helped me see that actually not all feedback is useful and you need to be able to separate yourself from it. And the good part came when another friend <laughs> sent something else and that made me very, very seen. So negative feedback can be extremely helpful because it helps you to know yourself better because you learn that other people can perceive you in a different way to how you're not and actually that's okay too as long as you know who you are and I think when it wounds you most is when it's the things that you don't like about yourself but also maybe are unwilling to make a change about that but talking about radical transparency I've seen how it's not helpful in companies because it creates a culture of fear that if you do something that is perceived wrong by the business or is maybe less than, then you just live in this constant state of fear. And that's not really helpful. We need to teach people how to give feedback in a constructive way. And then at the same time, teach people how to receive feedback also in a constructive way. But having just you know, saying absolutely anything without regard for how that person may perceive it I don't think that's right either. Mm -mm. I think, so. I think you know, there are some companies who've dumped feedback altogether. So I'd, I'd be interested because it, it will require a big investment. And to go back to Gen Z, I've already heard cases of staff, you know, storming off. They're not having it. They don't want to hear that sort of feedback that's ill-advised and not thought through. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something else we can learn from them. I love what you're saying about learning from younger people, because it's something that I have been saying for a while as well, thinking, well, is it even right to be demanding complete and utter sort of submission from employees? And if they're overburdened or they have too much of a workload for them to say nothing and just to accept that and to stand up for your own values and to set your own boundaries and saying actually it doesn't work for me so I think it's it's that tension between the two I think that makes it difficult for companies but it's an essential part for them to go through to actually create better cultures internally and to also to attract the right people who will stay and deliver on the results that the business is setting talking about also books yeah. You have a book coming mm -hmm. out next year, uh, Future Proof Your Career. Yeah, The Future Proof Career. The Future Proof Career. So why did you write that? Uh, because I was asked to. Okay. So some an editor at HarperCollins who liked the podcast got in touch with me. Uh, we talked, got a book deal. I got an agent. So I did it all the wrong way around, really. <laughs> but it's a book that's very much come out of 
the Working It podcast, which is aimed at a very, you know, it's a sort of very direct way of talking about work. I'm not, I don't, I can't bear jargon. There's far too much of it in the work world. And it's aimed at people who probably don't read business books or management books. It's just aimed at people who want to enjoy work more, make it work for them and to thrive essentially, and to work out whether your current workplace is a place that's going to allow you to thrive. So I sort of outline various ways in which you can see, you can audit your own workplace essentially. And I'm looking at some of the things that are coming down the pipe. Now, AI, for example, is something that I've touched on, but it changes every week. So I think when you talk about future-proofing your career, I'm talking more about the human elements. And when we talk about AI and technology, as we touched on, yeah, there are hum- really important human elements to that, which is you have to remain curious. You have to remain collaborative. You have to think about how you're going to essentially think of it as a co-pilot, particularly in professional jobs where generative AI is going to probably take over a lot of your admin tasks. Now, that's going to free you up to have, as the companies would like to think, much better relationships with your colleagues and your clients. What is really going to happen? I don't know. Is it just going to free us up to do more work? Because that's what hap- that's what's happened at every stage of technological advance so far in the workplace. So that element of the future-proof career is, I think, shrouded in mystery. But people don't change. So with AI and, you know, knowledge that technologies just free up us to do more work rather than give us more leisure time, what future would you like to see given all of the advancements in AI? See, I don't think we're ever going to get to the 15-hour work week, which is what Keynes predicted in the 1930s. I wish. (laughs) I think that some of the things that have come out of the pandemic have created the infrastructure for a better working life and our actual lives. So the notion of work-life balance, I think, is now outdated. It's just balance, essentially. So what I try to do and often fail, because I'm a a guilty Gen Gen X kind of person, is to, you know, switch off, to stop, you know, when you've got to your deadline to say, I've done enough work today. So, you know, good work rather than all the work, if you see what I mean. And I think that shift in in perception that we, you know, we, we may be paid for nine till five, but we're working nine till eight. But actually, why? Why don't you work nine to five and then stop, you know, work run nine to five effectively? Or when do you work effectively? So I think the pandemic threw up all these different things. So I think to set the conditions for the future, we have to think about how we work effectively, how we balance work with the rest of our lives and how we get on with other people in our teams if we have them and our managers. So there's a lot of elements there, but I do think without the pandemic, I know it was terrible in in many respects, but from a work point of view, it has opened up vistas that were unthinkable. For example, at the rise of asynchronous work. Mm -hmm. So you don't all have to be doing the meeting at the same time. Now, clearly there's way too many meetings still, but I think then the very notion that you can work independently when it suits you was, I mean, I, I know some, a lot of forward thinking companies were there, but most of them weren't. You know, I think back to when my children were small and I had to be in the office and then I had to leave to get them from nursery and I'd be on the Northern line with my back. You know, I was, I would be sweating with anxiety because if I got to the nursery late, you know, it's, it's awful. You feel a terrible parent and you feel the eyes of the nursery staff upon you. I I really hope there are no mothers in the kinds of jobs where you can work flexibly who have to do that now. Mm-hmm. I really hope the pandemic has changed that. I think it did, but I feel like, I don't know what you're seeing, but I feel like some of the companies are reverting back with regards to, okay, we, we've, we've done this hybrid work, but now let's all get back into the office because it's better. Like, what are you seeing about that? I think there is a push back to the office, but I think it's not going to be sustainable long term for C. There are older, older CEOs who equate seeing people at their desks with work. So 
the shift that's required is for them to trust people. And that maybe isn't going to happen with that generation of CEOs. But demographically, I think time, it's against them because younger people are not having that. And also people will, if you're asked to go back five days a week and you've been working at home you know, a couple of days a week and working flexibly, why would you? It's very hard to take autonomy off people when they, you've already given it. I mean, for me, it's interesting because I like the office, but I accept that I've been there a long time. I have a lot of colleagues who are also friends. I think friendship is very underrated at work. And I think in the future of work, if we do have a lot of tech support and we do have more time for our human relationships, those relationships might become more important. And I hope so. Although, of course, it's freighted with difficulty sometimes because you might have to lose call it you know in huge layoffs or you might have to fire someone who's become a friend but if you can navigate those things I think the office is a very rich place of connection in a world where there are increasingly fewer of them mm. I think this camaraderie is from my personal experience is what kept me staying in some companies even though perhaps you didn't like your boss or you weren't really quite happy with the way the business was doing things, but because you had this really amazing colleagues and support, you, you know, you, you had that sense of belonging in some way. And I had Bruce Daisley on the show. Oh, I love Bruce Daisley. He's great. Yep. And, you know, he was talking about how having great colleagues can inoculate you from bad bosses. Um, so yeah, so that, that feeling of, you know, you're kind of in it together. It's almost like like siblings against, like ganging up against like a bad parent or something uh, where you get what you need from a workplace, which is a sense of belonging. I think that is something that is, especially with younger people, that they are demanding that. That's, it reflects their personal values, what they believe in. And I think that's a good thing. That's the new buzzword. You probably know it's now DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. So I'm starting to see that mm -hmm. in some organisations. And the B is more important than the I because you can include people without them feeling that they belong. But again, like all of these buzzwords, what does it actually mean? So what does it mean? I think belonging is a noble aim. And I think you're right that younger staff expect to belong and they expect the corporate structures to accommodate that whereas for older people you go in this is how it is this is how we've always done things and if you fit in that's great and if you don't you'll probably leave so I think the belonging is particularly pertinent for people who've traditionally been excluded from uh, traditionally white male dominated professional environments and I think that's where I'm seeing a lot of work going on to make people from different backgrounds feel that this is a place where I could be. I don't know how successful that will be in the long term, but I think there's a lot of good intentions and good work going on. So, you know, I'm positive towards, towards the word belonging. It's a very warm word and we all want to belong, but I think it's exactly the same as, you know, when in the we never lose that feeling of being in the playground and not being picked or when our kids don't get invited to a party. We don't feel any different at work if a load of people go out for drinks and you're not invited. It's the same. So where do you look, draw the line about how you include people? You can't stop people forming cliques as friends, but as an organisation, you can foster connection. And maybe that's through events. Maybe it's through employee groups. Maybe it's much more informal than that. And I think it's a work in progress in a lot of workplaces, but I think it's really interesting and mm. exciting, actually. What do you think have been the biggest changes in expectation from employees of the companies they go to work with? I think the biggest shift that's happening now is that you will, you, you my manager, or you, the leaders of the company, will... Yeah, foster my career growth, that, that I have a career path that is clear and that I will be enabled on this career path. And I, I like that this has happened. When I started work in the early 90s, that there was no such thing. I think partly that's a 
because there was no internet. So you had no idea how other people were getting on. It was just what you saw around you. But now, because there's so many resources online and people talk to their friends, they understand what career progression is and people set goals in a way that has really shifted. So I've heard of people who won't accept jobs until they get assigned a mentor and they need to know who that mentor is and that they want to work with them. Or they might name a mentor that they want to work with. So those kinds of things, I think, are the biggest shift. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of shift from the company taking care of you. And I'll just hand my career over to you to essentially, it's a joint venture between the company and my own expectations. Mm. I'm thinking com- like from the leaders or companies' perspectives, this idea of hiring stars and whether they would see a person who has these high expectations as somebody who is more desirable than not. What do you think? I think if you're hiring someone who's already established, I mean, I'm sure you know more about this than me, you're hire- you have a very particular idea about what you're hiring So they come with that expectation or the reputation. I think when you're hiring younger staff, there's a balance to be set because if you're too, what might be perceived as pushy, now pushy is a very difficult word because my pushy is someone else's, um, you know, asserting my boundaries and rights before we go any further with this application process. But for a boomer or Gen X manager interview, interviewing somebody who's setting all these parameters around what they want, that I think that can be very difficult and off-putting. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of biases to be unpicked there. So I think when you're hiring stars, but that's a, that's another interesting point, isn't it? Do, do, you, do you develop internal talent? And I think a lot of younger people de- expect to be developed or do you hire in at a higher level? And I think that balance is, we're in a funny place with that at the moment Mm -hmm. because actually individuals are often a product of their environment. And so you may have found this with your work, someone who thrives in here may not be a star. And then they've got a huge amount of expectation to live up to. I, I actually think it's not an enviable, you might be on a big salary, but it's not an enviable position in some ways. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated with the idea of matching of individuals' personal strengths and their desires and what they want to achieve with what the company is doing. And I think there are so many still unknown factors. I mean, both with regards to well, how do you even assess yourself as to you know, what your strengths are or even what parameters strengths are. So, you know, before we had like the hard skills, now we talk about soft skills. Um, Then we're also talking about, you know, neurodiversity, which could potentially be, you know, a way of operating and a way of, of thinking in a completely different way. And how all of those qualities of an individual, like where would they fit in best? Because it's also in the company's interests to be able to find the people who bring exactly those qualities into that environment and it's a bit of a it's still a bit of an art rather than a science taking a person from one environment and seeing how they perform somewhere else I mean the closest we have to that is the idea of well if they have been successful in this type of an environment you're essentially looking to move them into something extremely similar rather than something completely different. So say, you know, if they worked with, you know, something arbitrary that they've been working with a team of 10, it's probably going to be a lot harder for them to work with a team of one. Or, you know, they, they're used to working with very clear objectives and, you know, very structured way, but then they go into a startup that maybe is still figuring out what their product to market fit is. So again, those environments are not super matching. So I think matching individuals to companies um, is very, very interesting. And it's nascent. It's a sort of, it's an emerging thing, is it, isn't it? Because you're not just looking at the CV, are you? You're looking at their, exactly as you say, their interpersonal skills. And I think you mentioned neurodiversity and that's something that five years ago, I probably hadn't thought about or heard of you know we've all worked with people who we found difficult in one way or another or who work in a particular way that is fascinating but very different and now you know 
neurodivergent individuals are declaring themselves in workplaces, which is good, very good. But our workplace, you know, our workplaces working fast enough to accommodate them. And how do those ND people fit into a team? And how can you as a manager get the best out of them? There's a lot, you know, people, there are so many more adult diagnoses of, Mm -hmm. you know, autism spectrum disorder and ADHD and all sorts of conditions. So, you know, I've got it in my family. I've had two adult diagnoses of ADHD and it explains so much about the past. So I'm neurotypical, I'm sure, but, you know, my husband isn't. And it, and it explains every, everything about his career, our marriage. And I'm so pleased that many more children are getting diagnosed. But I think it will radically transform our workplaces in a good way because it, it's the beginning of a way of understanding people, not just neurodivergent people, but everyone, neurotypical people too, in a, in a completely different way. We're looking at how does this person's brain process stuff? How do they react with others? And it takes us to a very different place, I think, and a good place. But it's it's going to take years. Mm-hmm. I agree. Have you ever uh, come across an individual, an author called Thomas uh, Erickson, who wrote a book, Surrounded by Idiots? Yes, I know that book. I yeah, it, it's, it's quite famous, isn't it? So good and so funny. And when you're talking about, you know, how different individuals interact with each other. So he uses the model DISC, which is a kind of like behavioral personality test and how it breaks down into roughly like four categories how different people from those categories interact with each other and it's just so so true and so similar and I think just what we were talking about earlier how you know some companies say we can't talk about this topic or conflict resolution I think we all need to learn how to accept our own you know personal skills but also you know how we're all different and accept people for how they are and to start seeing qualities as benefits rather than weaknesses and to concentrate on those more and applying them in the right ways rather than trying to make everybody fit into a certain mold because I think that's what we're realizing that's just not working like not everyone is the same nor do they have to be the same I think there is the benefit of having all kinds of different individuals they bring their own uh, benefits to the business definitely Mm -hmm. but I I do think there's a long way to go Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people you know neurodivergent individuals get pushed out of jobs that they're probably very good at for reasons that are are social reasons essentially Mm -hmm. they don't fit and that's you know think how many thousands of people have Uh, lost their jobs. I mean, I I find it extraordinary and incredibly upsetting. So I really hope things are changing. Mm. I think it's a work in progress. I think we're going through a difficult time right now. You're talking about how many people in the UK in the workplace are angry and disengaged. You know, it's been since COVID, it's been difficult. It's been a ride. It's been a ride for sure. So as we head into the new year, Obviously, lots of people think about New Year's resolutions and thinking about, are they in the right place? Should I be staying? Should I be going? Or, you know, how do I get promoted? What advice would you give employees to think about in the new year? Okay, number one is be kind to yourself, because I think we are so bombarded with, uh, you know, advice on on Instagram, in books, on the internet. And if you're a career-minded person, it's very easy to get quite obsessed with what I should, the shoulds in our lives. So I would just say, don't freak out, be kind to yourself. You know, life comes at you slow and then sometimes very fast, but the pace of it is not relevant. So be kind. And then at the beginning of the year, it's a really good time to take stock of what is it that you actually enjoy about your job because sometimes you know but when we're in the mired in the process of it and then the day-to-day we don't really take a step back it's almost like doing transactional analysis on yourself you know take a step back and think what is it that I get from this job you know are there more pluses than minuses because I think we often don't and, and include all the 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 job aspects of it like what you do in your job but also the human part of it like the colleagues the management team so I would do an or a beginning of year audit 
And if you feel there's a, you know, too much of a def- you know, is it something you can fix? Is there anything you can change? But if it's too much, the beginning of the year is a good time to start thinking about, do I need to make a change? And you can just let it percolate. I think a lot of people think, oh, I've got to make a change. So I'm going to start my job search on LinkedIn and polish up my CV. No, just have a little bit of a, a breathing space and think, talk to people, talk to people about what they do and what is it that makes them engaged or, or not engaged in their job. Find out the sort of the driving factor. And I hate the word purpose, but I am going to use it. You know, what is the what is your purpose and what are other people's purposes? And is it the same as yours? Because I think so often we're in our own heads and in our own workplaces. And that's a very it's a sort of it's a very insular way of being. It's part of this connection thing. But when we're with our friends, we don't often talk about work. I mean, I do. I have a couple of friends I talk about work with in a very sort of profound way and we share a lot but generally in big groups you know I you know a lot of my friends might not even really know what I do particularly friends we make as mothers where our common thread is our children so ask those people ask unexpected people ask your weak ties I just I just think start the year in a with a curious exploratory mindset maybe there is so much to say for self-reflection yeah. and going back deep to what you want. I think we can run around and be influenced by whether it's social media, friends, bosses, about what you should, should. be doing as opposed to what you actually want to be doing. And for a long time, this word purpose really bothered me. And I was thinking, why does it bother me so much? And I realized that my take on it, because I'm a maximizer, I feel like I need to know everything and then distill it to its most important part. And I think I looked at it from the wrong perspective where you feel like that your life's purpose needs to be this one thing that's gonna stay with you forever. And I've changed my mind about that, that it can be something in the here and now, and it's okay for it to change further down the line. The same thing with your values. It doesn't, you don't have to be the same person forever. So thinking about your purpose, like what's your purpose in the here and now that you believe in? And something again from, I'm gonna quote again from, you know, playing big um, from Tara Moore. He, she talks about kind of tapping into your inner mentor, which I thought was a really fascinating way because she kind of compares it with the inner critic, but then she kind of turns it around saying, well, there's, you also have an inner mentor inside you. And she does this visualization, which kind of can be a little bit woo-woo, but I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. It made me cry. It was so profound about like reaching inside you and kind of pushing away all of these, you know, rational, logical things in there and going right into you already know what you need to do. You are the expert in yourself. So go in there and kind of take your own advice, like listen to yourself. And I think there is this really huge benefit in, in spending time. In I like that. So you don't need a mission statement. That's the, do you know what I mean? People, I think, try to distill, as you just said, mm-hmm. everything down to an almost a mission statement. And that's absolutely not the, the here and now mm. is enough, actually. Yes. And the here and now is a combination of everything you think about your past, you know, your present and your future. So I think honing in on that and spending more time inside yourself, breaking through all of that and actually going back to like, what what do I need right now? And what do I want for myself? Because the answers are there. And maybe you don't need to make a change. You know, there are times in our lives when we really just have to keep going. You know, I've had many times in my life where I I literally haven't had a minute to think about my career. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And you just keep going. And that can be a, it can be a great emotional support to us when our, our lives are difficult. So I think that's also something to bear in mind. Don't make a change for the sake of it. No, for sure. I love to read. And up until now, I think I'm on to about 25 books that I've read so far, um, which has been quite a lot this year for me. What have been some of the books that shaped your thinking around work this year? 
So this has been a very rich year for me in terms of reading because I've been writing my own book and I found it impossible to read any fiction while I was writing. But I did read some very good books around work and life. And the one that stuck with me the most is by Arthur Brooks, who's a columnist in The Atlantic. And he writes a lot about the good life and but later life. And his book From Strength to Strength is about finding the right balance in your life after 50 which is where I am now and obviously most of my friends. And his big thing is that when we're before 50 in our careers, we're sort of doers. You know, we are out achieving, doing that stuff. And then after 50, that's when you should think about moving to what he calls crystallized wisdom. So we have the experience, we have the wisdom. How do we best use that in a workplace environment and in our lives? And so... It might be moving to a job where you are training or mentoring, or that might just be one aspect of what you do. So that's really stuck with me. It's about thinking about this third quarter of our lives, essentially, if we, because there's another great book called The Hundred Year Life by Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott, which a lot of work watchers cite as a very, you know, it is a very important book because it's saying we don't have to do the same thing. You know, lives are long now and you don't have to do the same thing the whole time. So that really has changed how older people think about work and life. And the other one that I've read recently and I interviewed the author is by Amy Edmondson, who's a professor at Harvard. It's called Right Kind of Wrong. Mm-hmm. She was a person who popularized the concept of psychological safety, which has become I would say probably one of the most prevalent <clears throat> workplace themes, although often misused and and miss, you know, people talk about safe spaces in the same way as they talk about psychological safety and it's not the same. So, but her new book, Right, Kind and Wrong, is about failure and mistakes and about how we can differentiate them and how we can learn from failure. And it's on the shortlist for the FT Business Book of the Year Award, which is unusual because... Many of the books we put on the shortlist are kind of narrative business books, you know, like the book about Theranos, Bad Blood one, you know, often about a billionaire or a CEO, those kind of really exciting thriller type stories. But this book is on the shortlist and it shows the caliber of Amy's thinking and her writing. And I think that might lead to a real shift in how we perceive failure in workplaces and how we can learn from it, actually. And, and not be ashamed when things don't go our way. It's on my bookshelf, top of my books at the moment, because that's the next in line. I'm really interested to read that because exploring failure is so important. And having spoken to, you know, successful people, founders, CEOs, you know, failure is such a massive part of our life. And there is this relic still of, you know, perfection, you know, glossy outside, not making mistakes, that everything somehow is very smooth, is very unhelpful way of thinking of success, because along the way, there is experimentation, there are, you know, you, you assume that it's going to work out one way, but then it doesn't. And reframing failure, and making it useful, something that is a stepping stone to your success, I think is so key. So I'm very, I haven't read it yet. So I'm very, very excited to read that. And I mean, she's, she's incredible. I think she's, I think this could be as important of psychological safety. And what I think is most important about Amy almost is that she writes in such a clear way and she talks in such a clear way. As you know, I'm sure, you know, the management and business book world is absolutely beset with jargon an impenetrable prose. I think it's people trying to make themselves look clever or preaching only to the in crowd who understand. And I can't bear it. Hmm. Looking at leaders, what they can be doing to ensure that they have a happy and productive workforce, what advice would you give them? Trust them. Be straightforward as far as you can be. Obviously, sometimes leaders can't tell the whole truth. There's st- some stuff that you can't tell your workforce, but tell, be as honest as you can be with them. Uh, so, that, you know, trust and honesty go a, a long way. And when there's bad news, don't cover it up by saying, you know, there's going to be some differences in our workforce size from next Monday. 
I mean, the, people can smell bullshit a mile away. And I think we often cover up uncomfortable things as humans and leaders are no different. So I suppose it's about them learning to communicate in a way that is direct and honest, but also warm as far as they can be, because you want to be the sort of leader that people want to follow. So there is an element of vision. I'm not going to say charisma. I'm going to say vision because a management, a manager tells people what to do, but a, we have to want to follow leaders. We don't have to. So I do think there's something there. And I, I think leaders' mental health has, has become a huge issue in the pandemic, and that's often hidden. And I'm not sure how much they want or should share with their workforces, but I think understanding that if they have these problems, then their staff probably do too, mm -hmm. is another big thing. Maybe the shame that we all carry around it will be diminished somewhat. So I have seen some leaders come forward and talk about it a bit. But there, I think you just have to find that that place, the sweet spot, essentially, mm -hmm. between saying too much. Because I think whatever we want to think otherwise, there is a mystique around leaders that we as a workforce want to believe in. So how do you cultivate that in a way that is honest mm -hmm. and not projecting something that you're not? Who do you think does it best? I, well, up until this week... I think Satya Nadella is very good at Microsoft because I think he's quite open. I mean, of course, but of course, the higher you go, the more open you can be because there isn't a risk really for you. And I think what was interesting was at a company like Unilever, where they had a leader called Paul Polman, who was very into sort of the green agenda and sustainability. And I think was quite an open and honest leader as well. And now that company, now he's gone, that company is moving in another direction. So I think leaders who do what they believe in, I really admire because sometimes you can't, you know, shareholder pressures, all sorts of stakeholder pressures. It, I think being a, a leader today is almost impossible because you can't do all of it. So you have to decide what are the things that are most important to you and delegate the rest. I think there's probably not enough delegation going on. Um, there's a woman called Lena Nair who's also at Unilever, who's now the CEO of Chanel. And she came from an HR background. And I haven't seen what she's doing yet, but I thought her appointment was great because I think we need more people at the top who have, maybe they're not always HR leaders, but people who are coming from a people focused side of the business is not something that has happened much in the past mm -hmm. but i think the future workforce will demand that they need it those are the skills we will need in the future the podcast concept is obviously anatomy of a leader but something that i've been thinking about recently is whilst you know we want to become better leaders ourselves what about the idea of becoming better followers what are your thoughts on that i think that's a concept that hasn't really been explored I did write a column once on how to, uh, on being a subordinate I was a deputy for many years in different roles and I was terrible at it I was a terrible subordinate because I'm I like autonomy and I like I have my own ideas so I think being a better follower is something that we could all do better at and actually there are quite simple things we can do like if we have a good manager pray you know say thank you praise them we're all human. And I do think that's really undervalued because we sort of separate people when they're leaders. If we're on the team or we're the workforce, we, we don't think of them as people anymore. I mean, obviously, we don't invite them to the pub anymore or to our social events. And that's part of the loneliness of being a leader, actually. That's maybe not appropriate, but it is appropriate to treat them as a human being. And I think I hope we will see more of that in future from all of us. Mm. I think we're all, it's something that you said earlier that you don't see yourself as the leader. And that was really interesting. My belief is that we're all leading one way or another. We might not be leading a country. We might not be leading, you know, a FTSE 100, but we're all leading in one way. And likewise, we also follow in others because, you know, we are either experts or influencers in one sphere, but maybe not in something else. So I think this this idea of of being both has suddenly become interesting to me that I'm exploring. But um, 
But I'm very excited about your book coming out. And thank you so much for coming onto the show. Super fascinating speaking with you. Maria, thank you so much. Thank you as well. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.